going down from there. Probably still still gonna be sitting right now. Yeah. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Just give it a second, wait for everybody to come in. Hamza Hussain, if Haruk, alaykum salam. Let's get on to the Insta, see what's going on here. All right. Boom, boom. No internet connection on my iPad, why is that? Doesn't make any sense. Who else we got? G Spice. Give it a second while everyone uh, logs in. Maham is here. Maham's got a star today. And she's in green. Interesting. Lily Aslam Ismail. Ryan is back, by the way, folks. Uh, Ryan is... He had a great trip to Spain to study with Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who's really one of the greatest theologians, in my opinion, of our time. Um... He understands the philosophies of, you know, the Western philosophies probably better than anybody else. And he can articulate it better than anybody else. So he had a retreat, like a Tarbiya type of retreat. It wasn't like heavy on theology or anything like that, but it was a really good retreat. Okay. Uh, Maham is asking about the Safina membership on YouTube. So I haven't actually seen what that actually entails. Like, what does that entail? What does Safina membership, what, what, what does YouTube membership actually do? Uh, we have to find out what it entails. Okay. Instagram's giving me a hard time again. What? Honestly, Mark Zuckerberg's, did his... Did I did. That's why I yeah, That's why I give it, because the killer vegans probably reported us. That's why. The killer vegans. When I sit next to people, um, I don't care if they eat meat from having dinner with people. I just want to make sure you're not a vegan. But you have to. Just don't be a vegan. My mom's vegan. Your mom's vegan? Kind of. She's from that whole generation of vegan and Reiki and all that stuff, right? Yeah. It's That's a package, right? Yeah. I've never seen her eat. Yeah. It's it's somewhat like acceptable from white women, right? Mm-hmm. It's not no, uh, something offensive, but it's, that's their culture, right? Just not accepted. We see, like a, a, you know, a brown guy. She cooks meat, though. She cooks meat yeah, for you. Cooks, okay, good. So she's not a killer vegan. She's yeah. just personally vegan or vegetarian. Does she eat cheese? She. That's like the only thing she eats. How could you, a person, not yeah. eat cheese? Like exactly. this is one of the greatest creations. Right, right. We're just waiting for everyone to log in here, and I'm trying to log into my uh, the stupid Instagram. I don't know what their problem is. Okay. Maham says. Um, Oh, she's she's able to color her name and she gets a star because she's become a member. All right. Hamza Makhbul, she said, watch, she watched the rights of the husband and the wife. And it was really good, she said. And he would quote R. Kelly. Is that the, that's that um, guy who got arrested recently. Oh, yeah. I don't know anything about him except that hit song that he did in the 90s. <laughs> um, because he did the Michael Jordan movie. Okay, Muhammad, Muhammad Zogs. He's asking, how did she get, she gets to color her name, she gets to use different emojis, I guess. Yep. Um, Maham also saw the lecture with Sheikh Sadiq six years ago. That was crazy. That was a long time ago. It's amazing how fast time is flying by. Instagrammers, unfortunately, I can't, I can't talk to you guys. Okay. Um. Inst- Mark Zuckerberg's platforms are so impossible to use, right? Like Instagram, everyone loves Instagram, but every two weeks they make me change my password. Every, uh, okay, here we are. We're back on Instagram. Now we're on Instagram. Yeah, I got it. Twitter, meanwhile, you log in, boom, it's right there. Oh, Facebook manager, right? There's a page manager because my thing is a page. It's not a personal page. It's a page. It is such a headache to see anything. It's impossible to see anything. So these things are just terrible. All right. In my opinion, Instagram's okay. Facebook, really 
pain in the neck to use because there's so many things going on. Twitter, easiest thing to use, which is pretty dangerous. Suspicious. It's dangerous because Twitter is just like street fights, basically. There's like no rules. All right, Jay Perez says, he messaged me a few pages from Hamidi Text by Dr. Hatsum. It confirms Abu Hassan al Ashari's methodology. Nice. Nice. He's Okay, I'm going to look for that. Noah, I need to get back to Noah badly because Noah's going to make us a killer intro, right? But it's just our organization is, is growing like this and our personnel is growing like this. And that gap has to be fixed, right? And it'll be fixed, I believe, within a year when we actually become like a... I don't want to make it depersonalized or too official, but the back end has to become official. My problem is I'm not an official person. I got to get someone else to do it. I call them suits. You know the suits? They have to have meetings, right? And they have procedures and they have timelines and they got PowerPoints. Those are called suits. I'm going to have to get a suit, but I, can't, I just can't be too close to him because I don't want to ruin my own personal way of doing things. I might drive him a bit crazy, but that's okay. Okay. Sophia is, is alluding by saying dead naming. You know, the, uh, of course, the liberals as um, the great genius, comic genius, and philosophical genius. Um, Dave Chappelle said, these liberals, anytime that they want to win an argument, they just make up a term. Yeah. Which is exactly the truth, right? They just make up a term. Oh, microaggressions. Microaggressions, dead naming, all that stuff. Because Jordan Peterson, a little bit of uh, news everyone knows. Jordan Peterson, he's been hanging out with Muslims lately. He did Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He did Muhammad Hijab. He did these other guys. I don't know what got in his head. And he kept giving us advice, right? And he releases a six-minute video that just bothered everyone, which it's so patronizing and so lame. In that it's just like he plays into all these like um, these stereotypes, and he suggests to Muslims get out there, interact with people, right? Um, get a pen pal, pen pal. <laughs> what, what world are you in? And he said, could be a Christian, and God forbid, even might be a Jew. It's like, what do you think? Like, who? What, what's going on in your head to even release a video like this? to tell us what to do. So, I mean, I didn't, I, that's, it was, it would, I mean, uh, Aisha says it was condescending and it was, and I would say it was one step short of condescending because, or actually past condescending because it was actually like stupid where you don't know us. You don't know anything about Islam. You're giving us advice. What's wrong with you? Okay. And this comes on the heels of him being expelled off of Twitter because he said that a woman who became a trans, she became a guy, she's a trans dude, I guess, and he said that pride was a sin and this woman, remember when she had breasts because she did a dual mastectomy, cut her breasts off, okay? That got him, because he used her old name, that got him kicked off Twitter. So that's the news. And that's why she mentions dead naming. And dead naming, another basically uh, term that they just made up. They love making up terms. And a lot of you people will be dealing with these, these folks and be like, oh, uh, someone will say, oh, you're dead naming. And you're actually like, I don't even know what that means. Am I, like, am I dumb? Because I don't know what that means, right? You're not dumb. They just made the word up like, Two weeks ago, if you knew all the English, every word in the English language in the year 2010, you would not know how to have a conversation with these people in 2022. In 12 years, how many terms have they made up? How many words have these people made up, right? And then they use the word as if it's a universal thing and they scoff at you for it, right? Oh, that's dead naming. So I had a, I had as a if like that's a known universal. I, yeah. So we were out... In Spain, we were with our friend from Turkey, and he yeah. brought this up. He's like, yo, you guys have all these terms. Yeah. Like, what, what is this? What are these terms that you bring up? 
So he brought up the question, and we were talking about it. Should we should we use them or not? Like should, we should never use these we should terms. Never use them. Never use these terms. Uh, you, do you you say, you say a word? Oh, that's transphobic. Okay, go back to like 1990. It's, that word did not exist, or not even close. Go to 2000. It didn't exist. Okay, maybe it existed. I don't know. One or two academic references. That's it. But now it's just like something you should understand, right? No, it's hot. It's as if to say that's hot. You'll burn yourself. Like universal things that all human, they act like that to make you, to destroy you, to fe- make you feel like, oh my gosh, I, I just did something so terrible and I didn't even know. And a lot of people are like this. They go into college, they go into academia, and someone drops that term, like a term with so casually and so uh, accusatorily, like it's very accusatory. And then they get destroyed. They're like sh- completely. So what you got to do when you deal with these people is, you literally have to say, listen, absolutely nothing that you utter or say has any meaning to me or value. Your entire worldview, your opinion, it has no meaning to me. And it also has no meaning to 90% of the society except that the big businesses, they need you as customers. That's the only reason they care. You have to understand that, right? And they're actually, some of their extremists, they go after these companies for hypocrisy. Like they, they call, they're calling out these companies as hypocrites. Like Gillette, when it makes a commercial for, um, I don't know, it's what they're supporting, some social cause. And they're like, wait a second, Gillette, what do you care? It's just that the bulk of their customers are that. That's it. So nobody really cares about it. If you scratch the surface, nobody really cares. But people are just intimidated because these people are just wild. They're rabid dogs going after people and canceling them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they just keep making up. And RD, R2D2 says they just keep making terminology to keep you one step behind the discourse. And then they drop the terminology. If you don't cancel that terminology right away, so listen, you just used a word that I don't believe in at all. Okay. I don't even care what it means. Okay. Um, so ultimately, we just cannot have a discourse with these folks, these progressives. Uh, Aisha Mukhtar can't keep up. Nobody can keep up, to be honest. I, I think they themselves cannot keep up. Now, uh, he goes back, and Jordan Peterson wants to have this unit. He's like, why don't you all get along? Like, you know, like an old grandfather who's been out of it for, for 20 years. He's basically been on the, out on the pastures for 20 years, ready to pass away. And he's totally out of everything. And then he comes to this huge feud between, like, two of his grandkids or something, or two of his kids, family feud. And he comes up, he's like, why don't everybody just get along? It's like, Grandpa, this is not how it works, right? You've seen some, I've seen, I've had people come up to me in the masjid, right? And one man says, you're, mashallah, that was such a good khutbah. From now on, you're, I'm going to nickname you Bin Bez. (laughs) 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 You made me laugh. He's one of the most beloved uncles. Now he's a grandpa in the community. For me, he's like an uncle. Like, I love him. I've known him for almost 20 years. And he's like, your nickname is Bin Bez. I was like, no, how about Booty? I'll take Booty, right? (laughs) He's like, what's the difference? Bin Baz or Booty? I was like, well, one is, uh, one is correct and one, he has some other things like in his aqidah. He said, yes, but most important, we Muslims to get along, right? So that's a great perspective when you're on the edge of something. Why don't you just all get along? But once you're actually, it's almost like coming, Hitler, come on, look at the Jews. They're not that bad. Get along, right? <laughs> Uh, so uh, it just doesn't work. Life, real life doesn't work like that. When you're on the periphery of something, yeah, maybe it, it's your perspective is so distant that you could have that. You could say stuff like that. But so that's the other thing that Jordan Peterson said that really made everyone, you know, laugh. Uh, and it was a joke. Essentially, his whole thing was that's why I said when the sister said condescending, it's like one step past that to the level of you just you don't even comment. You just move on. You don't really analyze it because it's not a serious thing. Um, this is funny. A big bank here in the UK announced staff will be wearing pronouns on their name tags. And if you don't like it, take your business elsewhere. How do you say that to customers? Like, what's wrong with you? Uh, Ali Ahmed says he always watches at a later time. That's well, good that we keep the YouTube up. Aniko Ahmed, there's a clear agenda behind Peterson's interviews of religious scholars. 
cherry picked by him to assist in tackling the ultimate target. Right? I don't know. Why is Muhammad Ali Aqubi the 34th generation from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but King Jordan, King Hussein of Jordan is the 42nd? Well, of course, because there are so many lineages. And some people live a short life. Some people have older sons. Like if you live a long life and you're the last son that your father produces a son at the age of 60. Back in the old days, it would happen, right? A guy could be 60 and he could have a son, right? So another man... In the same generation, he's 20 and he has a son, right? And that son has a son at age 20, right? You see the difference? So one man has a son at the age 60. Excuse me. That son has a son at the age 60. So that's a longer chain or a longer link, I should say. And then the others are shorter links. So that's why you could have 42nd generation, 34th generation, etc. That's how it works. Do you know which one is the shortest? Like how? I think 30s, in the 30s. Uh, Today on the earth, there is in the 30s still. Generation. Okay. That's how it works. Khadija says it's quite scary to be in academia. I don't even know how you could survive in academia. I don't know. You definitely can't survive in politics with the left. You can't survive in politics on the left even if you're a progressive. Because the progressives, their nature is to eat something. They got to eat something. When they keep hanging out with themselves, they'll eat themselves. Like the poor, not poor. There's like a transgender, ultra progressive, LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, you know, because Black Lives Matter is also against traditional family too. It's not just about race, right? But they had a coffee shop. It's like a total hangout for them. They got accosted and attacked and canceled right for for being owners and other things and essentially the workers the employees demanded they divvy up their company to the employees marxism i mean what in the world so there are trans people that got canceled so we're doing a pre-open qa before we get to our tips here today how, how are we doing on Instagram? All right. MashaAllah. Sarah says, why doesn't Peterson take his own advice with regards to the right and left? Stupid advice. I'm shocked. I, I agree. It was just like some grandpa coming in and come on, everyone get along. I, uh, Aisha Mukhtar, they're going to have to fire their CEO. No doubt about it. They're going to have to reassign him to some desk and put a new CEO. That's a disaster. This bank that says take your business elsewhere. How do you say that to your customers? What do I study, reciter says, after Fardain? You study Aqidah, heavy. You go deep into Aqidah. And Kalam, watch, Ryan, when you were here last Thursday, we did a monster stream on, stream on Abu Hassan al-Ashari. That, yeah. that was a monster stream. I was sad I missed yeah. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz and Abu Hassan al-Ashari. Yeah, those were, those were huge. And they were basically, um, it was trying to bring the bare bone fundamentals of what the idea of Kalam is and how important it is. And the idea that you want to take the safe side in Aqidah, fine, but don't lead. Because you can't say, you know what, look, at, all right, look, we had a riba problem, right? Let's say in fiqh, there's a riba problem. How do you get an education without riba? So one, how do you buy a home without riba? So one company tries, and it gets critiqued to heck, but it tried, right? And it found a solution. You don't like the solution, but fine. Another guy says, listen, I'm not going to make any mistakes. I'm just going to rent my whole life. Wonderful. You can die upon that, and you will be safe. But you're not the leader of the community, right? Because don't do anything and just freeze and live back in time. That's not going to work. You have to try to find answers to, this, to, to people. So we have fiqhi problems. We also have philosophical problems. We have people attacking and, and throwing out 
literally legit lo logic nunchucks at you to try to put a dent in your confidence in Islam. Kalam is all about defending the aqidah of Muslims from the perception that there's any inconsistency within it, as the Quran says. So it's part of our aqidah. As the Quran says, if it was from other than Allah, they would find much inconsistency in it. Part of our the, job, the duty of scholars is to show that it's not cons it's it's consistent. There's no inconsistency. There's no inconsistency within itself. There's no consistency within reason. Okay, uh, from the, between revelation and aql. How could there be an inconsistency between revelation, intellect, and observed nature when Allah is the creator of all of them? Okay, so we have to prove that. All right, prove it. You have to define what is aql and how what is the right way to use it because you can observe things in the wrong way right i could go out there and i say hey that the shadow's not moving swear by allah the shadow's not moving right well we would say you're wrong okay because one sample size of one glance doesn't is not sufficient you have to look at it after an hour and after another hour and after another hour then you'll conclude it's moving so slowly i can't perceive its move i can only I'm only certain that it's moving by looking away, coming back after an hour. Then I see its movement. Okay? So ob observation can be, has to be defined, and what's the right way to observe something? What's the right way to use your intellect? That Allah gave us and said, do you not use it? So what is the right way to use it? These rules are called al-aql. Does not the Quran say, or, or mantiq it's called, we revealed this Quran in a clear Arabic tongue. Right. So what does that mean? If it's in a clear Arabic tongue, shoot, the curtain's covering the air conditioner. Oh, that's what it is? I just want to use this and lower it like two degrees. It's okay. When Oz comes, he can do it. So if Allah says in a clear Arabic tongue, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is Arabic? Right? How can we know it's clear if we don't define what it is? Allah describes it. If anything has an adjective, the noun itself must be defined. So we have rules of Arabic. Okay, what are what is an error in the Arabic language? Can I say, the habtu ila baytu? That's a mistake in Arabic language. The bait should have a kasra. The habtu ila baiti. Right. So that's what we said here, and that the bare bone basics of kalam every Muslim has to understand. It's meant to show there are none of these inconsistencies. Then it's meant to show the inconsistencies in the heresies. How heresies are not consistent with the book, and how kufr is not consistent with itself. Okay? We, you cannot attack an atheist and say, Your kufr is not consistent with the Quran. He doesn't care about the Quran. What we would say to them is, Your kufr is not consistent with mantiq, cannot be accepted, or with reason, or with observation. A cosmology, the kalam cosmological argument, consists of a logical principle that cannot be debated. An observation that is not debated. And then it brings you a conclusion. If the first two are not debated, the conclusion must be true. The opposite of that conclusion must be false. Very basic thing, so I advise people, watch the previous episode on um, Abu, Abu al-Hassan al-Ashari. Okay. So Jordan Peterson is with the Daily Wire and Ben Shapiro is rising up as the don of the, of the left, right? He's such a nerd, but he's really smart. The he's, right, right? Uh, I mean the right. Uh, he's a complete nerd and a geek looking guy, but he's extremely smart and he's a shark, okay? He's like the John Stockton of the right. John Stockton, if you all remember in basketball, he looks like an accountant, but he's got the hair of, an, an, a, of a geek and a dentist and an accountant. No offense to accountants and dentists out there. But you know, like the straight-laced guy, okay? But if you look at this guy, John Stockton was a shark and a killer. He had an unfortunate thing in his career that he was stuck with Carl Malone. If he was with, oh my gosh, if he was with Michael Jordan. If he was like that, that shooting guard for Michael Jordan, right? Ugh. Or anyone close. SubhanAllah. So, so that's what Ben Shapiro is, and he's a hardcore Zionist. We can't even come close to him. He's like rabid dog Zionist. He wants us all killed, right? And he's like, oh, the Palestinians are putting their babies up type of Zionist. Uh, he's 
just you can't even come near him. He, you you, you want to learn something about his logical techniques, how he cuts up transgenderism? Fine, that's fine. You see, you could study that because he's destruct. He's, it's destructive, right? When you're taking something down, you could learn from even your worst enemy how to take something down. Certain things you do not need the moral or the aqidah of the source. Let's say you want to be a surgeon. You can, stu you can study to be a surgeon with anybody you want as long as they're a good surgeon because this is something that there's no morality behind it and there's no transmitted evidence behind it. It's just facts that you can all discern in front of our own two eyes. So you can discern these things. So that's what you could get from those types of people. Okay? Hmm. Someone is asking quick question. If Asr is in 30 minutes and the congregational time is in 30 minutes, what do I do? You pray. If you have to leave, you can pray and leave. But if you can stay, then you stay and pray with the congregation. We're doing a pre-QA here. Any good book on Islamic epistemology? To be honest with you, I don't even think you need a lot, but not in the English language that I know of. All right, folks, we are going to go to our... Um, we're going to go to our... Uh, our reading today, okay, we go to our reading, read from the book of Allah and for the barakah of reading from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then we will go back to uh, our Q&A inshallah ta'ala for our Monday, which is always a long stream in which you get to say a lot, but let me remind you all, don't bother posting a question right now, post it when we start the Q&A so that we could actually get every question live, okay? So we can answer the question on the spot. So as soon as the question comes in, I'll be able to answer it. And I'll try to do it rapid fire. Before we start, you can support this, this, this program. And we want to make this a monster program, okay? We want to eventually have multiple shows. Other people will be on this program, inshallah, uh, different times. So I'll have this time slot, and we are looking to probably fill in a Sunday night time slot. The UKers might not like that because it's going to be too late for them. It'll be in the, while they're sleeping, but the West Coast folks will really like it, and the East Coast folks. And it'll be with two of our shiuch here in the, in the, in the ma'ahad or the, the madrasa that we have here. So you can support that by going to patreon.com backslash Safina Society. Patreon.com backslash the Fina Society, and you can also get great books from our people. Meccabooks.com. I love Meccabooks.com. They've always been really good to me, and um, they've always been a big supporter of Safina Society and a sponsor. David is saying, Is it this Sunday we're starting? No, we're not starting the additional streams. The additional uh, episodes will not start this Sunday. They will start probably um, uh, the Sunday after that, maybe. So, but I'm just giving you guys a, uh, a a preview. Noah says, "Our our madrasa is it Dar al Fatih? I think it's going to be Dar al Fatih, and I'm purposely going with number one a name that has a baraka to it because I asked one of the wonderful shiuch that I consider to be." someone whose dua is accepted, to give us a name. And this is the name that he picked. He picked, first I said, give us a name for a masjid. He said, Masjid al-Fatih. But then we realized, well, this is not a masjid. It's a school. Ma'had. So Dar al-Fatih. There could be Ma'had al-Fatih, Dar al-Fatih, Ribat al-Fatih, but everyone seemed to like Dar al-Fatih. And the connotation there is that it's in an Arabic name, you are doing heavy duty studies there. Right? Whereas most of my other public classes on ArcView, it's for someone just coming in for the first time. So it's vanilla, it's very simple, it's in English, and I like to take people who are just fresh out of their toba, to be honest with you, and take them and so, show them the way to become talib ilm, or to at least just be literate and mutamakkin in his fundamentals of his deen. 
and then to, um, uh, to to maintain that with streams like this, that you learn something, but it's also light and easy to listen to for, to for a long time. But the shiuch at Dar al Fatih, no, uh, uh-uh. drilling, memorization, intensity. You better catch up. It's an actual like factory. It's like a military training program. So the name itself, if you're too scared of the name, that should give you a signal. You're not ready for that. If you can't even pronounce the TH, is it Feth or Feth? You're not ready for it. Yeah. When does a person consider themselves Talib Ilm? Very simple answer. There are three conditions. When you have, dis- you have understood the menhaj, when I say menhaj, I mean what positions and madhab of aqidah, usul, and fiqh. Okay? You have made a decision on the menhaj. Number two, you have isolated a text or a teacher. Either one. Some people go by the teacher. Some people go by the text. For example, when I was coming up, I didn't have teachers around, shiuch around me. So I picked a text. And I literally had recited it to Nabi Zaid. I studied with three people. A bulk of it with Sheikh Sadiq. Part of it with Sheikh Abdurrahman. Uh, 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 Wild Hajj. Uh, his name is Abdurrahman Wild Sidi Muhammad in Mecca. He's, he was Mauritanian. There's Mauritanians in Mecca. Wiz, Wizard of Oz, what's happening? Okay. And, there, and I finished part of it with um, a sheikh in Egypt, Sheikh Muhammad al-Jindi of Egypt, Azhari of Egypt. Okay. Other people that take one sheikh and go with that sheikh. So you have to isolate. Next, second point is you're either your sheikh or your book, your metan. And number three, that you have a systematic approach of studying it and a con- some consistency in studying it. That's it. You're thought of it. Even if it's once a week, once every two weeks, you're thought of it. Because you've, you've isolated your minhaj, you've isolated your, uh, your, 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 what you're studying, and then you have a system of doing it consistently. You're thought of it. So there's to be thought of it strong, thought of it that's slow. It's that, all the same in the sense of you're thought of it. Uh, R2D2 says, what is there in Dar al-Fatih and ArcView? ArcView is our online operation, and that is for walk-ons, someone brand new, and then we can take them to the middle levels. But Dar al-Fatih is solely in person. It's not online. So it's not really relevant unless you want to move here. Okay. It's not going to be totally relevant to the, to the people who are online, unfortunately. All right, now let's go to... But, but, but ArcView can get to some serious topics through the scholarship track, ArcV Plus, which this year we hope to have 200 level Kalam lessons on there. Okay. Bushra says, will you talk about Sayyidina al Hussein? Of course, it's going to be basically, um, it's going to be one of the uh, Thursday stories of the Awliya, the head of the Awliya, Sayyidina Imam al Hussein, because he's the Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah, him and his brother. So that's why we could say there's the head of all the awliya in Jannah. Shabab. Sayyida Shabab Ahl Jannah. Surah Al Adiyat. 11 ayahs. Okay. Wal Adiyat Yadabha. What is Al Adiyat? Qad ibn Abbas, wa ta'u mujahid, wa ikrim, wa al Hassan, wa al Kalbi, wa qatad, wa al Mukatilan, wa abu al Aliyah. It's the horses that are fighting in the armies. Okay? And Allah is saying, this horse, he has no Jannah. This horse will not go down and be remembered in the dunya. Yet this horse, he has not been commanded to fight for the sake of Allah. Yet this horse will go and, 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 and drive right into the opposing, opposing army with no fear. If the horse is doing it, why don't I do it? That's why Allah gave us animals in this world. We can find an animal with a virtue better than a human virtue. Look at the attitude of the lion. Only time you can ever get a lion is if he's tired. That is the only time you can ever defeat a lion. 
When a lion is tired, it loses its attitude. It loses its power. Hey, Oz, while you're at it, could you also get this? Because uh, it's fun plug too. Thanks. What is the be- is is the lion the fastest animal? No. But the cheetah's faster. Is it the biggest? No. The tiger is bigger than the lion. It's longer. It's heavier. The tiger hits harder. Is the ti- is the lion the most efficient killer? No, it's not at all. Not at all. Wild dogs have like a 90 to 80 90 percent kill rate. Lions don't. Lioness goes out to kill. It doesn't always come back. I think it's 40 to 50. Comes back empty-handed every other time. Is the lion the uh, heaviest hit? Of course not. The tiger again defeats it. The, The smack of the lion is heavier. The bite of the jaguar, I think, is stronger than the bite of the lion. What does a lion have that no one else has? In the why is he the king? It's is it his beard a little bit maybe his his appearance, but it's his attitude. Okay, so if this we see virtues in animals that are either really good or really bad, and Allah gives us a virtue in this animal, this horse will boom go straight into the battlefield no fear and it will die how'd you fix it because it's working maybe you're using the wrong headphones such a wizard yeah perfect such a wizard kool-aid left wing give it to the give it to the those people who uh, I haven't had this like since second grade you know what I wasn't allowed to have these when I was young my mom would never buy them (laughs) My, see, my, my my parents and our household, there were certain things symbolic of American. Like, it symbolized the bad thing. Lunchables. Lunchables? lunchables. Yeah, we weren't allowed lunchables unless it was a very special treat. I'll tell you what my, my, my parents considered certain things to be like the worst of the worst of American. Like the rotten kids of America. Right? McDonald's? Because there was a the time we didn't eat halal. Right? We don't know any better. And Kool-Aid was one of them. Like, we never got that. My dad was into Burger King was fine because he said it was like cooked, like actual, like real cooked meat, whereas McDonald's is trash. And then uh, Coca-Cola, of course, he was a big fan because that hit the Arab world. Coca-Cola hit, and they're all addicts. Okay. So, but I haven't literally have not touched one of these, like I'm telling you, in like ages. How did you get it? They're downstairs. They're downstairs? Oh, okay. Someone must have brought them. Okay. Well, Adi Ati Labaha. So this animal... If it's doing it, why can't we do it? If the lion is an animal and Allah created with that attitude for us to learn, how about the eagle? The eagle's another animal to love because the eagle, there's no animal that actually um, seeks out the storm except the eagle. Every other animal, uh, bird, when it rains, it goes away. The eagle will fly around seeking out the storm. Why? Because it found a way to benefit from the storm. It uses the storm for its favor in two ways goes above the storm and the current of air pushes up in a storm so it is allowed it, it's allowed to rest its wings it literally does nothing it just holds its wings out and the the air will push the eagle up and on top of that it the air will push the eagle up so high that it could get a view that it could never have gotten before it will get a view of the world that it could never you know get before isn't that an amazing metaphor? Like, in the time of fitna, you do so little, when, you're, when Allah is testing you, you do so little, but you get a perspective that you would never have gotten before. Isn't that like an amazing analogy? Uh, let me tell you another amazing analogy in, in the creation. That's why it said the creation, the intellect, the book can never can contradict each other. And it's all analogies and lessons. Oud, the oud that we burn. Now there's a couple types of oud. This the first type of oud is um, the sap. That's one thing. Frankincense. It's, it's, it's very good. It has medicinal properties, actually. The second type of oud is, is the stuff that middle class people use every single day after dinner. And that is basically wood chips that are dunked in perfume. That's the stuff that we buy for 50 bucks. It lasts us for like a month or half a month. But then there's the real deal. The stuff that you see in the Khariji homes, in the Khariji stores, in Mecca, it's burning at Dar Mustafa 24-7. 
and that is the actual real wood chip that has been inf naturally infused. Now, let me tell you how it's been infused. This tree, it's only one type of tree that does this. One or two. Agarwood. So how does this work? So if I get an agarwood tree, I plant it. Well, I have a wood. No, you have a regular piece of wood. The environment around this tree makes it sick. And the tree is going to be killed by fungus. There is a fungus that Allah created to attack the agarwood tree. Now that tree itself, though, defends itself by releasing an antidote. By releasing a response, like an immune system of a tree. That response mingled when it fights the fungus... And it kills the fungus. Okay? That antidote then makes the whole tree smell the way it smells. Right? And you don't smell it. Now, here's another analogy. So that's the analogy of Tawbah, isn't it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What does it mean? It means the believers, if they are touched by an attack from Iblis so that they make a mistake, okay? To the karu, they remembered. They turned back to remembering Allah. فَإِذَاهُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ And lo and behold, they now have insight. Okay? They're now better than they were before. After their war with Iblis. Now here's another thing about. The Ud is also a metaphor for the mu'min. Is that on his own, you leave him on his own, there's no smell. It's just a piece of wood. You, you would not know anything from it. Neither does it look any amazing nor smell amazing. But you take it and you put it under the test, you put it in the fire, it releases the most amazing smell and disappears in himself. So what is it a metaphor for? The common Muslim who dies a martyr. Because the common Muslim, you don't benefit, there's no benefit from him. He's just living his life. But when he gets tested, he dies a martyr. So like this wood chip. So we can't say like he's a metaphor of a scholar because a scholar by himself is releasing benefit to the people. But the martyr is somebody who is completely normal, living his life completely normally. But then he gets hit by cancer and his response to the cancer inspires the whole community. Or the whole family responds. It gets inspired by his response. That type of person, that's the metaphor of the ode. Let me tell you something else. That trials and tribulations, this is an amazing dream. Eventually someone, we're going to have to cut this out and make it its own clip because it's an amazing dream. A woman in Egypt, she had a vision. She had a vision that she was a farmer woman. Okay? Very simple woman. Okay? Working in the farms of Egypt, she has a vision of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Someone says to her, hey, go over there. The prophet is there. So she says, okay, definitely. She starts walking there. As she's walking, she sees a blind person reaching, trying to go, Where, where's the prophet? Then she looks and she sees a man with no legs pushing himself like this to see the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa He sees another person limping, that they're paralyzed from the side of their body, limping, dragging his foot to see the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Another person burned, like a burn victim. See the Prophet said. Other people healthy. Okay? Other people very rich to see the Prophet said. Other people very poor. All sorts of like everything you can imagine. But stick what sticks in her mind are all these miskeens. They're so miskeen. Blind, deaf, mute, burn victim, all these things. Finally, she reaches the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she sits next to the Messenger of Allah. And she is a Sharif, Sharifa, which means she's from the lineage of Sayyidina Hassan. So she has the right to sit next to the Messenger because that's her grandfather. And she sits right next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have to say that because some people may think that's not right. No, she's sitting right. Firstly, and all dreams, there's no Sharia in dreams. In the sense of uh, the symbols of dreams, you don't say, oh, this was haram or halal. Okay? It's just a symbol. But in this case, it's like a true dream. So she sits right next to the Messenger, sallallahu and he welcomes her. And she says, she's looking at all these people coming to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she feels bad for them. And she says, أَلَيْسَ رَبُّنَا رَحِيمٌ 
Is not our Lord merciful? The prophet looks and says, Bella, for sure he is merciful. She then says, what about all these people? They're his believers. Blind. Pushing himself because he has no legs. Paralyzed. Can't walk with and can't move one leg and one arm. Deaf. Mute. Burned. Poor. What about all these? Where's the rahmah? And the Prophet ﷺ responds with the verse of Quran. وَلَوْ رَحِمْنَاهُمْ وَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِمْ مِنْ ضُرْ لَلَجُّوا فِي طُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ If we had mercy upon them, Allah says, if we had mercy upon them and remove this affliction from them, their destiny would have been to oppress in the land and seek from its pleasures until they committed sins that take them to the hellfire. لَلَجُّوا they would have gone without limits in their excessive يعمهون, okay, destroying their akhirah. Who knows this? We don't know this. So I can't come to somebody and say, let me afflict you so you can get better. Only from the definitions of Ar-Rahman is that he alone can punish can, or can afflict somebody and his affliction is a mercy. He, he can afflict somebody with a terrible, uh, seemingly terrible thing now, but it's a mercy for his future. Why? Because Allah knows that if they were totally free from this affliction, they would have used their ni'mah to do wrong. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. SubhanAllah. So this affliction that they're on, it is the mercy. When Allah sends an affliction, it's mercy. You may not see it right now, and you may not like it. Actually, guaranteed, you will not see it, and you will not like it. But when we're afflicted with a tribulation, we have to actually insist as a matter of belief that there is so much good in this. And now you have to become like a pearl diver looking for the goodness. Where is the goodness in this? Right? So that's, it's an amazing lesson that came to this woman in a dream and Allah knows best that she may have been thinking that so Allah gave her the answer in his dream. Right? Amazing. Alright, so this animal goes straight into the war with no fear. وَلَيْسَ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْحَيْوَانَاتِ يَضْبَحْ غير الفرس والكلب والثعلب وإنما تضبح هذه الحيوانات إذا تغير حالها من تعب أو فزع وهو من قول العرب ضبحته النار إذا غيرت لونه وقوله ضبح نصب على المصدر ومجازه والعاديات تضبح ضبحا وقال علي هي الإبل في الحج it's the camels that take us from Hajj. من المزدلفة إلى منا. نزلت في وقعة بدر. كانت أول غزوة في الإسلام بدر. وما كان معنا معنا إلا فرسان. We only had two horses in Badr. Sayyidina Ali says, Zubair and Miqdad ibn al-Aswad. فكيف تكون الخيل عاديات وإلى هذا ذهب ابن مسعود. So the uh, Sayyidina Ali says, no, no, no. What Adiyah to Dabha is not the horses in battle, it's the camels in Hajj that take us from place to place. Right? So here's another animal that has a stamina and an ability that's uh, beyond. So he says, we only had two horses in Badr and therefore the plural would not work. But you have to understand a rule in Tafsir. Okay? Tafsir is about the language and it is not restricted to the circumstance of revelation. So anything that fits the language of وَالْعَادِيَةِ ضَبْحَ is a sound tafsir, if not the circumstance of revelation. Okay. So if, if Sayyidina Ali tells us here the circumstance of this revelation is the camels of Hajj, not the horses of Badr, that's the circumstance. But the tafsir can go to anything that fits the bill. The language. الْعِبْرَةُ بِعُمُومِ النَّصْ لَا بِخُسُوسِ التَّنْزِيلِ Memorize this. Al-ibratu. Al-ibra means the lesson of tafsir, the fruit of a tafsir. 
بعموم اللفظ is by whatever the language suits لا بخصوص التنزيل not because of the specific reason it was revealed so if someone says uh, uh, this verse was revealed for the kuffar well that's what Muawiyah said to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari Sayyidina Muawiyah and Sayyidina Abu Dhar had a debate in Damascus okay and Sayyidina Abu Dhar he talked about the Umayyad family your family they're stealing from the zakah money uh, from the tax money that's the ummah's money okay and he says that and you're not spending it properly and he cited the verse of Quran uh, of those who hoard gold and silver. Muawi said, that was revealed about the Christians and the Jews. So that's khusus at tanzil Sayyidina Abu Dhar said, it, it was revealed about them as a warning to us. Meaning, yes, it was revealed about them, but the warning applies to us. Right? So that's al-ibratu bi'umum al لا بخصوص التنزيل. You want to learn something technical? Uh, this is like a technical, usuli, uh, interpret a uh, very important thing because sometimes you say a tafsir. It says no, no, that's not the right, right tafsir. We're not talking about خصوص التنزيل. We're talking about عموم اللفظ. عموم اللفظ is what is a valid tafsir. Okay. This actually answers the question that I had. Which yeah. Is like a lot of times in the Quran, mm-hmm. it's like it's not like the kuffar believe any of this. So why are we told about the kuffar? And, you know, I think there's examples where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the kuffar. Mm-hmm. It makes sense that it's a warning to us so that we don't resemble them. All of the speech to the kuffar is not recited by the kuffar, exactly. right? Yeah. All the, the, the khitab towards the kuffar is not, is, is not uh, at all uh, recited by them. And if it's recited by them, they don't believe in it. It's for us. في المورية قدحة سيدنا عكرمة عطاء والضحاك ومقاتل والكلبي saying it's the horses that even go through fire okay. يعني القادحات قدحا يقدحنا بحوافرهن with their hoofs okay. they go through it or they, they, they go through the fire of war Okay, so this is an image here of the horse going through war. قال مجاهد وزيد بن أسلم It is the It's the trickery and the plots of enemies. يعني رجال الحرب مكر الرجال أما والله لا أقتحن لك ثم لا أريان لك so it's the fire of plots or it's the literal burning heat of the sand or the rocks or the sun or or, or, or the ground that the horses go over or it's the plotting of soldiers. Again, the horses Oh, it's again the war horses going out in the morning. And Qurtubi said, it's the camels right, that go out during Hajj. So, again, is the, some people said it's the horses at war, others the camels at Hajj. But the dominant are saying it's the horses at war because the camels at Hajj, it's not like, what's the risk that the camel's taking? Like, what's the difference between a camel going from Minna to Muzdalifa? Or from Arafah to Muzdalifa? You never go from Minna to Muzdalifa. You go from Arafah to Muzdalifa versus going across, going from any other town to any other town. Like, the camel's doing the same thing. What's unique is horses. And, and by the way, you could take a mule to, to do that job, right? You could take a mule from Arafah to Muzdalifa, to Mecca, uh, to, Mecca, to Minna, etc. But no other animal goes to war the way the horse goes to war. فَأَثَرْنَ بِهِ نَقَعَا فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعَا فَأَثَرْنَ بِهِ نَقَعَا means it leaves traces of dust behind it. And that's actually one of the beauty of watching a horse is to actually see the trace of dust that it leaves behind it. فَوَسَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعَا أي 
dakhala wasat al adu the horses they get in the middle fa wasatna bihi jama wasat they get in the middle of the war uh, when the when they in mesh you ever watch those movies man yeah. they break like the line yeah. like the the cavalry is the one that the opens cavalry it. opens it up yeah okay and you know how do you handle the in the olden days the same way that any youth today knows how to do a pick and roll okay any youth knows how to set a pick okay and then move move around it and then dump it to the guy whose defender was picked that is not a pick and roll right so every all youth knows how to do this all youth who play football they know how to do a slant pass okay which is basically like you go out on an angle and then you cut back in so your defender's behind you okay so people know how to do these things because they the, the, but in the old days what were they doing okay in the old days they used to know basic war strategies so what is the basic war strategy by which so many people won their battles all right and Salah ad-Din was an absolute expert at it and the Romans were experts at this if you ever faced horses coming at you if they bring the cavalry at you okay the cavalry's coming this way and your soldiers are here what do you do how do you defeat this you don't take down the cavalry head on what you do is what they called the feigned retreat and that is start acting chaotically and yelling chaotically then half the troop goes this way half goes this way you look like you're running away and then very quickly you turn around you wrap around them okay that's the famous play called the feigned retreat it was something they do in war and what they would do is they would literally invite it so that as they're in meshing like this i don't know how to show the audience you're in meshing like this after a while when you want to finish this battle off quickly you start to to fall back fall back fall back fall back and they're coming in coming in coming in and then your guys lap around and usually there should be horsemen waiting on these edges hiding and the, and you get on those horses and you wrap around okay so that was the famous strategy and now you sandwich them cuz not all of you wrap around half of you wrap so a quarter of you go to the right a quarter of you to the left and half of you stay that half that stays are very important cuz they're going to keep them attracted they're going to keep the other enemy coming and killing us, right? Fighting us, rope a dope. But then all of a sudden, those uh, those troops come around the is, back is this what and Khalid sandwich them. This was something like a pick and roll, like a slant. Every so coach every, uses a slant. Every has everyone does this slant. It's just how good did you? And now, how did the Romans do it? Well, the Romans had, if they had a chance, when they were able to do this, what they did was that the the infantry. The first phase that they would do is they would try to thin out the opposing army with what they called hell. I don't know what the Roman word for hell was, but it was basically the the arrows on fire and they would rain hell down on the enemy. Oh, that's where it comes from. Oh yeah. Yeah. Rain enemy uh, this is old so thin them out first. That's the first step. Then once the battle enmeshes, the infantry will do a little bit of damage right but once the infantry starts to thin out the infantry is the guy on feet they all break they all go backwards okay when they break the what the romans did have when they were able to do it was that they would have all of their cavalry hidden the other enemy uh, opponent doesn't even know that their cavalry is there and as they pull in pull in pull in right then the cavalry comes in now what the romans would try to do is to pull into a downward valley. So those infantrymen they're sac- they're sacrificing themselves, right? They're literally like taking the blow like a rope dope, but they're going downhill and fighting someone coming against them uphill. But what does that mean? That means when the cavalry comes from the back, they will be coming downhill on a people who will turn around and see a horse uphill. And then that's finished, it's all over. The ca- that cavalry, they're basically coming in, it's like uh, like like Mariano Rivera, three strikes and you're out. This game's over, right? They wipe them away, and that's how the Romans. That was basically like 
Roman Conquest 101. You just, that's what you did. You only went away from that if you had to do something else, right? You, don't, you only went away from that uh, if there was something different about the land or something different about the enemy, right? So this is well, the very basic way to how they used to win. Yeah. If everyone knew about this, then why, like, why is it so effective? You so know, see it coming. certain things, okay, Michael Jordan's backing up on you. You know what's coming. Mm. You can't stop it, yeah. right? All right, Brady has Gronkowski and Edelman. You know what's coming. You're not stopping it, mm. right? Yeah. It's about doing it well. And if you did it well, that means you hid your cavalry. That's the first thing. Oh, so you don't know which direction they're coming from. Yeah, I don't know from. when they're coming from, right? Or when they're coming. And when they're coming. And, and when you have some, some rudimentary tribes, they don't have scouts. They don't have the ability. Right. So it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. That's why they say war is figured out now. Yeah. But like now you have cyber warfare and yep. everything like that. But before it was kind of cut and dry. It's pretty whoever cut and dry. numbers, whoever has, yeah. it became a resource game. Yeah. And then and now you also have to know that in the old world, if, if you're going to a fight up to the Nordic people or something, they might not, n not all their soldiers would be educated on this. So just because a few generals know it, right. it would be chaos in the ranks. Like when, if 50% of your guys don't have a clue what's going on, right? Yeah. And only 50% do know what's going on. The 50, they, you can't control it, right? So you're, out of, you're completely out of it. And that's how they basically did it. And you only went away from that. There was an amazing fight actually between the French and the British one time olden days okay the old days where uh the french heavily outnumbered a british faction and the french at that time were armored from top to bottom like how do you fight them every time you hit the guy you stab the guy it you hit metal so one guy was really really smart okay and he just waited and waited and waited and waited okay and he picked the land that was a valley and he waited to the rain. As soon as it rains, that's when we're going to fight. Okay? And we're going to take off all of our armor and we're going to split up into little groups. Okay? And then once we get these guys with their armor to come into the mosh pit, they're going to slip. Yeah. And they're they're gonna, too heavy they're to gonna, get back up. They're too heavy to get back up. Yeah. And so you just get them and boom, neck into the, you, you go right uh, for the little gap. So uh, Noah says he, he's familiar with this, right? So mm. that was a good one. That was a great strategy. See, I like the old strategies of war. You know why? It's comprehensible, right? Right. I, yeah. I don't like the new strategies because you know what's, what's going on, right? You really don't know what's going on. Like no one can say, oh, this happened and this happened and this happened. It's almost like IT. Ask an IT person <laughs> what he does, right? <laughs> you ask an IT person what he does, and he, you're going to get gibberish, I like to ask a uh, gynecologist, what do you do? I treat women. Uh, mm. Podiatrist, what do you do? Fix feet. Okay. Chef, what do you do? Cook food. Teacher, what do you do? Teach Dean. Like w three words, two words. But war today, it's not like that. You can't put in, there was a game plan and boom, this happened and that happened and that was it. So. So another question for yeah. you. Yeah, bring so, your mic closer. So um, it's a little bit echo. You know, bring it closer. The Romans... Versus, or the Persians, they yeah. were vastly out, you know, they vastly outnumbered the Muslims. Yeah. And the Arabs, they're, it's like they're a bunch of tribes. Yeah. But I would have to imagine, like, that they weren't very organized. So we know that Allah gave the Arabs and the Muslims tawfiq. Mm -hmm. But were the Arabs skilled at this type of warfare as well? Or did they kind of just figure it as they went along? No, the Arabs were not skilled in uh, warfare. They were not trained in warfare. They were not a people of warfare. And they didn't have a history before this of warfare, except the petty stuff amongst themselves. So how did the Prophet wasallam organize them in times of war? You organize by your family, because you're going to want to protect your family. So when the Prophet came into the conquest of Mecca, and before that, he set the precedent. We're going to put these people with their family, tribe by tribe. You would think, oh, we're all Muslims, right? No, that's in life. But in war, you want to protect your family. Right. And you know your tribe, and you respect your leaders. So if we're going to war, for example, imagine all of us are going to war. And then they just like put Ryan, you go with this got people from South Carolina, you go with people from Chicago. That's You're what like, they do nowadays. I don't even know who you are. Right. Right. But if we all came to war and the Chicago community is with their imams, 
right? New Jersey communities with our, because we already live together. Right. We already listen to there's each other. There's a chain of command that you there's, know. there's already a chain of command right. here. We talk so, about it all the time, too. Like if yeah. The lead is like, yo, if we're in a war, <laughs> yeah. what role are you going to play? Yeah. We always talk about it. We plan for it. We got a plan for it. We got a plan for what I talked with Maliki Click, like some kind of breakdown of society where we're going to need to come together as a gang. So then he comes in and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was one thing that the Prophet established. Another thing that Khalid bin Walid did was all psychological warfare. So for example, the night before a war, one of the wars, he saw their, their, the scouts told him he was vastly outnumbered. So Khalid bin Walid, he said, every soldier, go light a, a, a different fire. And he had them spending, you know, the bulk of the night lighting fires for like all the way across. Right, so a fire. You imagine there's like twenty guys huddled around a fire, right? So when every guy is, is lighting a fire and they look out at night and they see the whole horizon is covered with different fires, they imagine it's that. He brought sometimes extras, make noise, just make noise, like hit hit stuff, bang stuff. So at nighttime you see fires and you hear noise. Um, in the daytime, now the light has exposed you, right? So what does he do? He gets extras, kick up dust. For all the, across the horizon, kick up dust. He did another one. He would go and he would um, have people, have his soldiers leave the battlefield, change their armor and wear brand new armor and then come back. They'll think that reinforcements have come. Right. He used all these mental tricks to make up for the numbers. Right? And most of his wars was never a head-on attack. So the, you, you fight in two different ways. Right. If you have the power, you just do a head-on attack. Yeah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loads on the Yom al-Qiyam. He brings uh, the king who lied. Why do you need to lie? Right? You can yeah. head-on attack. So, why do I need to lie to you? I'm stronger than you. Right? The king who lies, is something is out of place here. Right? Why do you need to lie? When you're the king, you could just cut my neck off. Right? right? So... Um, so that's the head-on attack. Now, if you're weaker, you have to fight by, like, attrition. Right. And guerrilla, that is, guerrilla warfare. Yeah, basically. you have to nip at the edges. And I would imagine the Arabs were good at this because this is what they did to each other. For that's what they did to each other. So Kharibin would nip at the edges. Right. Nip at the edges, right? Just keep nipping. They, they, can't, they can't concentrate you uh, on you in one right. area. So you're, like, in 12 different areas. How do you... F so you have to break up your, your army. Hmm. And so he would nip, 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 nip away. And that's how you achieve anything big. If, you want, if you're a small person small resources, I mean, and you want to do something big, you can't go on a head-on attack. You have to nip at the edges right. until slowly you've built up something for yourself or slowly you've, you've narrowed away the, uh, the big mountain that you're trying to attack. Right. If you can nip, like, this is, this is sound crazy, but it's true. Um, if you have a mountain in front of you and you got a hammer, that's all you have. Logically speaking, if you can break one... In one square inch of the mountain and render it into dust, you can destroy the whole mountain. It's just a matter of time. Right. And then you teach one other person to do the same thing. And it's just a matter of time. Right. So that's how they, that's how Khalid bin Walid fought. And maybe, you know, one of these things, it'd be a great series to do his battles, his strategies. Hmm. But someone's got to analyze the strategy, not just say he won and he won. Okay. So that's uh, in terms of battle and warfare. Now he goes into the lessons, to the, the khitab to the human being. Oh, human being, you're ungrateful. From being ungrateful. From being ungrateful. You know that one of the signs that your iman is increasing is that your view of ni'mah is now different, right? Because, and this is something I think all of us can get good at for the simple reason that we, we are interacting with the fuqara all the time, okay? and we fast, if there's a sliver of meat against you, in your plate, I mean, that's a massive ni'mah. If you woke up in the morning and you looked, you have to really consider that ni'mah. If you walk, I remember one time studying a class in, in uh, science I had to do as, an, as a uh, mandatory part of science, uh, study of diseases. What do you call the study of diseases? Is it not epidemiology? Maybe? Yeah, epidemiology. Study of all the different diseases. Now we got to the chapter on the diseases in the womb. The amount of 
the defects that could happen. It's a miracle anyone's born normal. When you read the number of defects, well, if this... You would imagine everyone has something. Exactly. SubhanAllah. If this genetic sequence is touched, boom, you can't see. If this one is... You have no nose. Oh, if this one, <laughs> you're paralyzed. Right? If this one, your skin. It's unbelievable how many... Oh, if the woman inge uh, in ingests too much of this chemical right. and her body's predisposed to this, boom. If the man, this, that, and the other, his sperm is all jacked up and boom. How do you, is anyone born normal? Right. It's unbelievable. It's to show us the rahmah that Allah has with us. When, you, when I look around, sometimes I look around at, at uh, people and you see somebody with, let's say, their arm is paralyzed. And he's 20 years old. What a bala that fell on his head. Unbelievable. You start asking of Allah, oh Allah, let us enjoy this shifa that you've given us. Like this, uh, 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 afia. I fear from sickness. I mean, if you don't wake up and realize how lucky we are not to be sick, not to have had an accident. No, someone perfectly healthy had, a, had an accident. You see some of the accidents are senseless. It's not like self-inflicted. There was a guy recently in South Brunswick. His job is to hedge, what are you, trim the hedges. The guy's trimming some hedges. For some reason or other, he crouches. Maybe to fix his hedger. You know that hedger? Yeah. Just those like, are dangerous. Those are dangerous, right? It's like a piece of plastic yeah. and it's hedging up all the weeds and everything. I don't know, sometimes it gets stuck in the weeds. So he's got to bend down and fix it. While he's bending down to fix it on the edge of, I think it was George's Road. He's bent down fixing the hedges, uh, fixing his trimmer. A girl is texting and driving. She smashes his spine, snaps his spine, kills the guy, right? Other causes, of course, he hit his head. But he was crouched down, and she's texting while driving. At that moment, his hedger had to be fixed. At that moment, she's turning the bend. At that moment, someone texts her, and she just railroads the guy. If he, if he had survived, his spine would have been snapped. But he hit his head as well, and he's dead. And this guy, he's got six kids, too. That's why it hit the news. She was found guilty. No. Uh, Hispanic. And um, she was found guilty. She's 18 years old. Like, her life is not going to be the same anymore. And people like, cut out the, the pitchforks, right? To, she should be, you know. First of all, explain to me what jailing an 18-year-old, putting her in jail, is going to do for those six kids and that wife. Like, how is that beneficial? Okay, punish her. I think they're going to give her several years in jail, but let's say punish her. Punishment with, let's say, six to a year in jail, just to feel the hardship. Fine. But then again, what she actually did, we all do. Are you going to all tell us lie and say you don't text while you're driving? So it's not like she went and did something so irresponsible. She did something we all do. She just happened to just do it at the wrong time and in the wrong way. It's a reminder to us, though. It's a, it's a reminder. We shouldn't do it. So let's say she gets punished for a year to scare everyone from doing I Here's my punishment. As long as these kids are alive. Or after you hit a million bucks, you will work and your salary is going to go to them. All you're going to get is enough to, is, is, is the bare bone market of rent. 500 bucks a month for a single bedroom and 200 bucks for food, 100 bucks for gas. That's all you're going to get. You get to keep one to $2,000. Beyond that, you're working. And that money's got to go to them because it's involuntary, as he says, involuntary manslaughter, but they're putting her in jail. The dia, dia is so much better. So much better. It's so inhumane. Yeah. You know, you're putting a girl... 18 year old girl yeah. who's, you know, probably lived a pretty high class life, you know, middle class or something, most likely. Yeah. And now you're putting her into jail or into prison with everyone else. What do you think is going to happen to her? Yeah. Like, you really, you know, it's her fault, but you still feel bad for her. Yeah. It's so sad. So, so it's, it's got to be, jail to me is useless. Let them work. Let her, she's 18. She lives with her dad. Let her dad pay as well. Right. Because Dia is by the tribe. It's right. paid by the tribe. Exactly. Right. So let the entire family start coughing. 
Because you know what that does? Let's say if one of my kids went and he damaged a property and they say, well, you're paying for it. Well, I know he doesn't have money. Guess who the court's going to come to? It's come to me. Guess what I'm going to do when we get home, right? Yeah. I'm paying for your stupidity, right? For your mistake. All right, come. Let's deal. I'm going to have to deal with them, right? My emotions towards that person, the emotions of the tribe towards the criminal is what's going to fix them up because they're going to be pissed. We got to pay the dia because of your stupidity, right? So, I don't know. And as I've always said, we got to just bring back lashes. Now bring so back much lashes. Easier, huh? That's so much easier. <laughs> and, and we all see you limping around and we all learn. Well, life, there's a guy texting and driving and he's limping around. I'm not going to text and drive probably for a week. Every time I see someone limping around, I'm not going to text and drive. By the way, there's a, there's, there's a strong case even in the Western system. Yeah. There's a good uh, book. I think it's called A Case for Flogging. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, a, it's a book written by like Western legal scholars. Yeah. They talk, you know, capital punishment isn't really all that bad. As it's, is, is this controversial for me to say or no? No, no right? No. Yeah, like a lot of people, they, they see it as a very viable system. Yeah, I, th- I think it's very viable. It's economically viable. It's, you're, you're also, you're warning other people. Especially if, you, if they're public. Some people should watch the, the, the lashes, okay? Um, they should watch it. And we all get to see the guy limping around, right? right? Now, you're a kid, and you're going to sell drugs. And the cool kid above you is teaching you how to sell drugs. Then that cool kid gets arrested. If he disappears into jail, that's like cool. To, yeah. In some places, going to jail is like graduate school. But if he comes back, right, and his butt hurts, <laughs> we all make fun of him and he's laughing. Now all of a sudden, I don't want to do drugs anymore. I'm getting you know, made fun of. Right. So we got to be able to see this. Okay. And then some of these people, why are we keeping them alive? What is the point of a life sentence? Explain that to you me. You know, that's why, why I keep understand. you alive. You know, like right? Batman. Yeah. He okay. Joker kills. Like, he does genocide on an entire portion of the town. Yeah. Put him in Arkham Asylum. How does make any sense? Bane destroys the city. Yeah. Now you're putting all these guys in the same place. Oh yeah. You know, Batman should be getting the life penalty for yep. not killing these guys. Exactly. <laughs> you put them all these, and they they get it's graduate school on how to be a better criminal. Right. Listen, if I ever what I ever we ask a lot. Yeah. <laughs> If I had to go to jail, okay, I must, you have to join a, a gang in jail, okay? You have to, to survive, okay? Unless it's like one of these mediocre community jails. But if you go to a real jail, you have to join a gang. So you have to become bad. And to join these gangs, you got to do something bad. You have to kill somebody, right? For us, we'll have to turn Salafi. I would probably have to, hey... Send me the Bim Baz books real quick. Right? <laughs> right? Hey, you have a collect call. No, they'll, res- they'll, they'll respect you because you're Arab. And then you yeah. Just got, uh, as long head. as they don't look me up on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. then I'm dead. Okay? I'm going to be like... Than everyone else. Then. I, I, what I'm going to have to do is try to do something so crazy to be put into solitary confinement. Yeah. Right? Because I go to jail in like Newark or something like that, and I hope that they don't see know who I am, I'm going to be have to... You're going to get a collect call from me. <laughs> Send me the PDF refutations of everyone. I need to memorize it and say it for the safe to save my save my life with all the Salafi uh, gang in jail. But Sheikh Rami's trying to transform that. Tariq is trying to transform that and and get like some Ahl Sunnah teachings in these jails because right now it's all hardcore, hardcore Madkhali Wahhabi Salafis, right? وَقَالَ الْحَسَنُ هُوَ الَّذِي يَعُدُّ الْمُصَائِبُ وَيَنْسَى النِّعَمُ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ who is an insan al kanud? La kanud. You are okay. like this, Hassan says, the one who forgets his ni'mah. And he remembers his fitna. He remembers all the tribulations. So 45 years old, you ask, how are you doing? Well, for the last five years, I've had diabetes. Okay, but you are okay for 40 years, right? Fudayl ibn Ayyad says, al kanud. الذي أنسته الخصلة الواحدة من الإساءة الخصال الكثيرة من الإحسان that one problem one bad thing makes him forget all the good things you have to be in a state of goodness in order to receive a tribulation right like sometimes I say to myself I run a business 
I'm so overwhelmed by the work in this business or in this organization, and I'm upset. You know what I always remember myself? Bro, you, you have so much ni'mah to even have an organization, to even have a business. So compliant, complaining about the one side effect of being too busy. وَإِنَّهُ عَلَىٰ ذَٰلِكَ لَشَهِيدٍ Which means, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كَوْنِهِ كَنُودًا لَشَاهِدٌ شَاهِدٌ That إِنَّهُ Allah is witnessing this. Okay? And Ibn Kaysan says, But the ha, the pronoun, is رَاجِعَ لِلْإِنسَانِ نَفْسِهِ That he himself admits, he himself admits he's an ingrate. وَإِنَّهُ يَعْنِ الْإِنسَانِ نَفْسُهُ Because the next ayah, وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ He loves goodness so much. He loves money. He loves food. He loves horses. Like we, we all love food, cars, that khair, general goodness. حُبِّ الْمَالِ وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعَثَرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورُ do you not know what أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ Do you not know what's in the grave that's going to be you someday? So cool it down a little bit on the حُبِّ الدُّنْيَا أَحْبِبْ حَبِيبَكَ حُبًّا مَا Prophet ﷺ said, love what you love with, with make it tempered a little bit. Why? Because you're going to separate from it. فَإِنَّ فَإِنَّكَ مُفَارِقُ You are one day going to be separated from it. And it also may be the cause of your pain someday. أحبب حبيبك حبا ما عسى أن يكون عدوك يوما ما. Love your beloved with with temperance. One day I might become your enemy. So cool it a little bit on these emotions. وحصل ما في الصدور. Then all of what's in your chest of secrets will be revealed. I'm telling you, you want to know if. Um, uh, if your dean is good, would you publicize and would you have a problem if your computer was hacked and exposed all your search history? If all your search history would be exposed to everybody in a hack, would you lose sleep? Right? That's الصدور, what's hidden in your chest. In other words, your secret deeds, all exposed. Just think about that for a second. Your search history. Your Lord, Azza wa Jal, he, he knows that thing is cackling in the mic. All right, so that's the end of Surah Al Adiyat, basic tafsir from Sayyidina Al Imam Al Baghawi. All right, open QA time. All right, open, go now to your open QA, and let's take everything. By the way, as, as I said, do not send in a QA while I'm talking. You guys can comment all you want, but I may, I will not be looking until now at the cues. So if you put a question in the past, uh, put it again here. And I'll open up the Insta and see what's going on. My Salafi friends would not be happy to see my... Uh, that means most probably it's good then. Your search history. Now, Ibrahim, what happens if someone looks at a woman mistakenly, their eye and their gaze goes where it shouldn't be you make up for it by looking at something good okay such as for example tilawat al quran right look at something good i wouldn't lose sleep if my search history was exposed how to make your pakistani mother happy <laughs> despite trying for 3 decades i don't know that's some people they uh, their, their life circumstances are tough but they don't know how to turn off their toughness. That's a problem with a lot of people. So, for example, there could be a single woman, right? 
and that single woman has to raise five kids. I, I just saw a single woman raise seven kids. All of them are like good. They're good. MashaAllah. They're good kids. How does she do that? Clearly with some toughness, right? <coughs> toughness. But you need so much toughness, sometimes you can't turn it off. And when you can't turn off that toughness, then uh, like you become hard to deal with in other situations. I'm not saying that's her, but in general. Another brother says, you, you please your Pakistani doctor by becoming a Pakistani mother by pleasing your, by becoming a doctor. That makes sense. A uh, question for you all. Um, uh, what are going to say here? Uh, okay, uh, Ryan, could you read me the instant? Because it's just not coming up here. It's being annoying. So Oz is, uh, Ryan's going to read me what's going on on Instagram. Okay. You can't see it? You can probably pop out the comments. Oh, yeah. right? I'm going to try again. Ryan, what about that button? Open comments. That green button. All right. In the meantime, is there ever justice without punishment? Justice is one way to do things. The other... Oh, great job. Again, what a wizard. Yeah. Then... Um, there is forgiveness and then there's the middle course which is compensation all three of them are different types of justice meaning that it's finished the case the case is closed all right let's go up to the first question that we see on the insta and go up a little bit up 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 up, up. oh never mind it's opposite someone said the mbic events over the weekend mbic's are local community events if and it's a local masjid, and we had a lot of community events. For example, we had a marriage event. I didn't see Oz there, though. <laughs> right? I saw a lot of other brothers, but I didn't see... Are you there? Huh? You were I went because the picnic was after, uh, right? Um, yeah, I heard there was a lot of kalam about that. What? They were like, why was it that the marriage event, and now everyone is coming from the marriage event with yeah. their name tags? Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> into the picnic. Yep. So the, the Eid picnic was right after the marriage event. Okay. And all the marriage event had, you know, uh, uh, the name tags. And um, I think some people got, uh, were interested in each other. Khala White says, can I unveil myself in a way that I keep my hijab cap on to get a facial by a female non-Muslim ethnician? Yes, you can. Okay. Please make dua that I get married soon. Strangest, come to the Mawad events. A lot of people get married on apps these days too. Ahmed Ali, what do you say? You got married on an app? <laughs> Adizman says, if something is not halal, but it makes you closer to Allah, and we make dua for it, does that mean Allah wants us to get that said thing? For example, you love a woman. She's not halal for you. But your love for her keeps making you make dua to Allah and begging Allah to Allah, I'm going to be at your doorstep forever to marry this woman. Die, live or die on the doorstep of Allah, you'll be good to go. Right? That's the only way I can understand his question to make sense. Right? Something right now for me is not halal for me. But I love it so much, I'm going to be at the door of Allah to Allah. Guess what? You might find being at the door of Allah to be more sweet in your heart than this woman. And if it's the reverse scenario, it could be the reverse too. It could be a man too. A woman who loves a man. So just say khalas, all right? This is, this is what I personally love. That's what's going to fill my heart. So I will camp out for the rest of my life in front of the door of Allah Ta'ala. That's it. And at, if, if I, either Allah is going to give it to me or I die upon this. That's it. Can a person enter Islam by merely saying the shahada without possessing knowledge of the six pillars of Iman? When a person says the word Islam, there are certain understood things in that. Namely, that the book of Muslims is the Quran, the Prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that there is an afterlife and that God is one. So the shahada comes with those known by necessity things. Okay? comes with that. I have a question. Yeah. With the hadith of Shafa'a, where like the last person to be saved from the Shafa'a of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is someone who said the shahada one time. Does this imply believing in it? Or like if someone's like, 
you know, grandma's just passing away and you just like get it. Just it it implies believing it. I believe it. Because what is Iman de- de- defined as by the Asha'ira? A tasdiq. Not al kalam. You have to believe it. Can a woman get a body massage by a female non Muslim masseuse? The answer is yes, but she cannot reveal her aura. There's not even a convert does not get circumcised except by himself or his wife. If a, if a guy converts, and let me tell you a funny story. This is the jahil of people. Okay? A woman, it, it, I had a classmate in Sauce, is Moroccan. He comes up to me and says, my dad wants to talk to you. Blue collar Moroccan family. Really great people. All right, what's going on? He talks to me. He says that his, his, his sister has fallen in love with an American, a British guy from college. Now, show us how, teach this British guy Islam so he can become Muslim. I met the guy, he was a really nice guy, and he genuinely accepted Islam. He used to work in the cinema business, uh, holding the mic. You know the guy who's holding the mic? He was actually that guy. Boom, boom, operator. Boom, operator. All right. Now, the, from the, from, I have to say this is Jahl, but it's, he's an innocent man. He's an older man. He had one obsession. Circumcision. Like, <laughs> Let's teach the man aqidah. Teach him deen. Let him learn salah. It's like, how can he be a real Muslim without being circumcised? Right? And he wants the guy to go to the hospital to get circumcised. Well, guess what? Haram. Who wants this? The father? The father of the bride. Uh, How can he be a real Muslim without being circumcised? It's like, Islam is not about circumcision. Uh, He should not be circumcised because that would entail revealing your aura for a non-necessary reason to a stranger. And we don't do that. So if you want to be circumcised, you get the in-home kit from Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) Have your wife spray you down, okay? All right, probably better off when you're sleeping because if your wife is touching you, it might not be possible anymore, right? And then have her circumcise you. Don't, do not try this at home, and this is not an endorsement for that behavior, but that's the only way that you can circumcise yourself, okay? Or you do it yourself, okay? Get some bing, what, what do you call it? We call it bing in Arabic, numbing. Get some numbing, learn how to use it in the right way, and, and don't put too much. You might be numb for more than, than you want, right? So you numb yourself, and it's literally a device, it's a machine. I've seen it happen to my son, my baby, because that's, that's allowed the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. as a baby. It's basically like a device. It almost looks like a cooking device, and you peel the skin, and then you cut around it like you're cutting like a, a mango, right? <laughs> cut a mango like this. There's two ways to eat mangoes, right? The right way to eat a mango is to, cut, to, to get it vertically and cut it horizontally, take the top off, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> That's how they do it, okay? And that would be the right way for a convert to get circumcised, right? It's you or your wife. That's it. There's no other option, okay? I like how this has come up multiple times in the past past few months. What's that? This this topic. Circumcision? Yeah. (laughs) We we had another hilarious thing at Eid. A a woman, I think she's Pakistani. Mango cutting for convert. Okay. Oh, okay. The Pakistani woman, she wants to buy her kid an Eid outfit. Okay. She buys her, her, her kid an Eid outfit, and the. Um, <laughs> <'Cause it's blind. laughs> Poor Noah got, him, got himself put in a five minute penalty for saying mango cutting for converts. Um, you hope that Ryan forgives you earlier than that. He then. She buys her, 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 her kid a beautiful Turkish Eid outfit. The poor kid gets to Eid. All the Turks are cracking up. It was a circumcision outfit, right? Because in Turkey, in Morocco, in all the Arab world, they wait until the kid's immune system gets stronger. And they circumcise the kid at age eight, seven, eight, when the immune system's strong because there's so much infection in the old days. In the, in the current times, there isn't, Okay. So that's why they do them right in the hospital. They'll do it right away. And then uh, uh, when it comes to other kids, 
in the older world, they would have to do it when the kid's seven, eight, and there's a special party, circumcision parties. They, they still have them till today. All right. And uh, he was wearing a circumcision. All the Turkish people were just cracking up. <laughs> I always thought that the Akika happened after the circumcision. I thought they were no, Akika for us in the Maliki Madhab is in the first seven days and you pass out the meat, like Udhiya, yeah. like Qurbani. You don't do a party in the Maliki Madhab. It has to be in the seven days. Albanian Revert, what should the wife do in this case? Does she have the right to divorce? What, if he's not circumcised? Oh, there's a question. Sorry about that. Albanian <laughs> Revert. <laughs> she, she, the mother of the groom gets a call on the <laughs> wedding night. All right. Albanian Revert says on Instagram, what about a husband? He enters Islam okay, because the wife became Muslim first, but he's not practicing or learning the basics of deen and has been two years. That is grounds for divorce if he doesn't pray. It is grounds for divorce. What is motivation, says Adizman, to do Salat al Hajj? Well, the best motivation of all is think good of Allah and His generosity. Look how much Allah has given us, all right, without asking. Imagine then if you asked. The generous person. Imagine this. Imagine you're, you're at home and you're studying, and your mom, she sends you a plate of nuts, then iced ginger ale. Then, okay, um, what is what is MM saying? Go back, go back, MM. Wait, 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 wait. What is that? Retract what? What? I just described how it's done. What was about? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, he's fine. You can keep him. Yeah, but no, there was. What did we say about that? Nothing. Just show you how it's done. There's a device that you use that put the skin over it and you cut. And you, you, if you have to numb it. There's nothing wrong with that. right? So what well, I'm saying, imagine now that you're studying. Your mom gives you some nuts. Then she gets you an iced ginger ale. Then she makes you some fries. All to encourage you to study, right? At that moment, if you ask your mother for something, isn't she going to give it to you? She's being so generous to you, Right? So likewise, Allah has already been so generous to us. Okay? So when you imagine, if you asked what you, what you would be given, it's just people just don't ask. And if they ask, they don't believe. That's the problem. And if they ask and believe, they don't have patience. You have to have patience. All right? You're going to have to go through the school of sabr. Allah will put you through the school of sabr. All right. Uh, the music question. Sophia and Maham are like planning, gathering. If you live in an area where Muslims are not organized, they come and go to the masjid and there are some Arabic and Quran classes for kids and that's it. Okay. Yeah, you're going to have to go outside. Where should someone start to create a community of like-minded Muslims for their kids to hang out? Look for the shiuch. Even if you have to drive far, but you drive maybe once a year or once every few months. Okay. All right. Uh, Dino says, go back to Dino's. Uh, some people said just rent. You're, if you're, you said you're not a leader. Stay there. You're not a leader. Oh, uh, stay there. Uh, What's oh, going on? Every time a new comment comes Oh, up. a new comment. I thought Ryan's going up and down. <laughs> I was like, all right. So, no, I mean, a, 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 a person cannot be a leader in a field if they have no action upon it. For example, in politics, like my personal thing is I'm not even going to touch it. All right, so you'll find some other political leaders. I think it's a lost game either way. But that doesn't mean that we don't try something, right? Try something else. So in that field... No, I'm not a leader in that field. If someone says, no, I don't do dawah, I just teach technical subjects of fiqh and deen. All right, then in dawah, you're not a leader. In teaching aqidah and fiqh, yes, you may be a leader. You see the difference? Right. So in certain subjects, you may not be a leader. There are people who are leaders in the field of halal loans. They're the ones who deserve to be that, right? 
uh, to, to be, they're the leaders in that field, even if they're not leaders in other fields. How do I make up missed prayers that I can't even enumerate? You estimate the amount of time, overestimate it, and then you, for that many number of years, you pray every obligatory prayer twice, and you don't pray any sunnah or no effort, except if you've prayed your make-up prayers for the day. You intentionally miss prayers. You have to make a major tawbah, of course. No, you don't make forgiveness and that's it. You need to make them up. You still, it's a debt to Allah. Like, I didn't pay my rent. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I didn't pay my rent on time. Forgive me. Okay, I forgive you. Still pay the rent, right? Is there a difference between, like, iqab and, like, a sin? Like, for example, like, you know, the definition of fard versus is that if you don't do it, then you have Allah's iqab on you. Yes. Is that, is that different than being sinful? Meaning that on the day of judgment, is it a different thing for me? Like, you know, each prayer, is it going to be on my scales or is this completely different than the good deeds and the bad deeds that I have? I don't know if that question kind of makes sense. You're it, not doing an obligation is a sin. Right. Yeah. It's absence yeah. on your scale is a sin. Sinful. So, like, how weighty is that in opposition to me? Like, like what I mean by that is that is there, there's no, like, numerical value that we can put of a fard, of course, is doing a nefid, right? Because the fard always outweighs a nefid. 100%. So how exactly to, like, do we kind of do that? Do what? Like that kind of calculus, you know what I mean? Uh, for missing a fard? Right. Missing a nefid has no sense. Right. Missing a fard versus not, like, or doing the haram. Um, oh, uh, well, this debated what is worse, missing a fard or f- doing a haram? Right. Many said doing a haram is worse. Why? Because munafiks also can do uh, doing haram is worse than missing a fard because munafiks can share in doing fard. Right? But munafik will not worry about Allah's wrath and sins. Or they said fara'id are just physical taxing on the body. But avoiding sins is a temptation of the nafs. So that is a harder fight. And Allah knows best about that. But we know that nothing salah is the most important thing. Like missing salah would be the worst of all things. Okay, because the first thing we're asked about is is is, is uh, salah. On uh, Instagram, what if I'm not sure I missed a fard or not? You'd have to consider it to be missed, unless it's wiswas. Caitlin, you said Allah will put us through the school of sabr. Can we ask for Allah to bring ijabah quicker? Yes, we are allowed to say Allahumma ajil bil faraj. Ajil bil faraj, make it come quick. We're allowed to say that because complaining that we're we need Allah's uh, to to come quickly is an expression of our weakness and our trust in Allah as a savior. So it's actually a good thing to do. Nuh yeah, he says, if a woman in her early sixties cannot stay awake to pray Aisha after ten because she works at three a.m., can she combine prayers, or does she have to thug it out? Um. You can't combine prayers as a regular practice, right? You can't combine prayers as a regular practice. Uh, to support Safina society or let's say an organization, can it be sadaqah on behalf of deceased or does it have to be a gift? It, you can give any gift on behalf of a deceased Muslim and intend that that financial gift be for them. That the reward goes to them. Okay, next question. What is MM saying lately, Ryan? I didn't find it to be inappropriate. I mean, maybe uh, different scent to, to, uh, people have different tastes about these things, but he's describing it. Okay. Maham has to go. Why come sit down to everybody? To, to her, uh, she says, "Salam alaikum to everyone." What are some minor? What is minor shirk besides showing off? A really cool guy is asking about showing off. I guess that's the irony. But uh, if you show off in the worldly sense, show off your car, showing off your ni'mah of the worldly sense, that is never shirk or riya. Um, okay, MM says, fine, you wasn't inappropriate. Thanks, MM. No, no, he says... Oh, that's someone else saying that? Oh, okay, it wasn't appropriate. Okay, no problem. I mean, look, it's stuff, stuff is up for opinion. No problem. MM could have his opinion. That's no problem. We don't usually do these types of things, but... The subject itself is sort of funny. 
But um, showing your, your stuff off of your worldly things is never shirk or riya. It's always, it's merely just bad manners and bad character. Shirk and riya, what shirk asghar, it's called, the lesser shirk or riya, is doing an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of other people's benefit. Uh, sorry, for the sake of other people giving you something, such as their attention or their praise for other than Allah. So that means ikhlas is to worship Allah hoping for a reward from nobody but Him. Hajra says, when we have to make dua at the time of rain, for example, because one of the times of ijaba, Allah answers prayer when you make dua while it's raining. Is it enough to read the dua of Musa or do we make any personal dua? You make any dua that enters your mind that makes you feel excited. Is a person sinful if his pants go below the ankle? No. The hadith doesn't say pants. The hadith says the undergarment, which is the, 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 the thobe or the wrap. And the reason was that in the old times, that was actually a way of showing off. If you look at all the old Roman movies, they're dragging their thobe. So that was something very specific in that old world to drag your thobe. But pants, everyone wears pants at that normal length and that does go by, past the ankle and that, so that's not what it entails. Okay. Because the, the, the illa for that is with the intent of showing off. That's the, we have a direct proof of that from the Prophet wasallam, who was asked by Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, I'm thin and my izar falls past my ankles. And the Prophet said, but you don't do it for showing off. Okay, so the Prophet ﷺ put the illa that you're doing it for kibr and riya, or kibr and, uh, and that kind of showing off. All right. Reed says, non-mahram guidelines aren't lifted when it comes to dealing with the elderly. There is flexibility with the elderly. Yes, there is. When someone is very old, for example, there's an old grandma. I can shake her hand and give her a hug. Right, like a 70-year-old woman? Or like she touches your head. Yeah, she, t- yeah. she touches your head. Yeah, those, like an old, old grandma. Let's say she is walking across the street. I can walk her across the street, walk her down the masjid. There is a lot of leniency there. Yeah. But now, what about hijab? I think that there is... There's more leniency of the old woman than the old man. There, I've, I haven't seen it be treated the old man to the young woman, but I have seen it from the old woman to the... I mean, I said give her a hug. Maybe that's in excess. Walk her across the street, something like that. Things like that. There is room for that. Maybe that was excessive to say like, give her a hug, but walk her across the street or something. But for an older man and a young woman, no, he's still, he may still have desire. So there's nothing changes between the older man and the younger woman. But there do, is a change for the older woman. Uh, MM, what is your comment? MM said a comment. Oh, so I think what he was basically saying mm-hmm. was that he said that he just said it was inappropriate because we're joking about the sunnah. So if you want to oh, yeah, I because said. it's a sunnah to get circumcised. Oh, I see. No, I think what everyone was laughing about is the idea of someone circumcising himself, right? Or his wife circumcising him. That's like a sort of a funny visual. But no, of course, it's 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 a wonderful... M.M. is right about that. He's 100% right about it. Or she. I don't know if it's he or she. Of course, uh, circumcision is a uh, sunnah that separates us from everyone else. If you make a mistake in the second surah of salah, says Chief Latif, do you restart the salah? Or pray sujood of forgetfulness. Only if your mistake involves reciting out loud versus silent. But if it's a mistake of recitation, such as you said something like uh, wrong in the verse, then no. You do not do sujood as sahu for a mistake of tilawa. You make a mistake if you make sujood as sahu if you are, um, did the out loud silently or the silent out loud. I have a question on this. MM says, I'm a brother, and we, I hope we don't have beef. No. What we don't, if, what we don't have beef when someone cares about the sunnah and says, don't make a joke about the sunnah. Now, of course, we don't make a joke about the sunnah. Maybe 
the way that people do it in the sense of, you know, the, the costumes or circumcising himself. But no, no, he's right. It's not a joke. Sunnah is something that should be treated with sanctity. So I thank him for that. Yes. What if you accidentally salam out of the prayer? If you accidentally salam out of the prayer, that means that you have thought you finished the prayer, yet you owe another rakah. That means you get up, you fulfill what the rakah you owe, and you add sujood sa. Wait, so I was asking you this question recently, and I just wanted to clarify because I still wasn't sure it was over text message. Yes. So like, when I salam out, now do I have to make a new takbirat al-ihram? Of course. Okay, so like, it's as if I... You're out of the prayer. Right. Oh, okay. So I am yeah. out of the prayer. You're out of the prayer. But in order to fix the prayer, I need to make a new... like New takbirat al-ihram. And a lot of time should not have passed. Right. Nor talking about yeah. something outside the prayer. Now, does that takbirat al-ihram need to be while I'm standing up? Or does it need yes, to be... Yes, of course. You stand up and do a whole new rakah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And then a And then a ba'di, right? And then this sujood al-sahu is after... Um, no, it, that's... You, you do a qabli because you left off something. Yeah. Oh, you left takes, off something. That takes over. Yeah. Okay, mm. left off. Let's say you prayed three instead of four. Right. So what is your mistake? Leaving yeah. off a of fuck. Yes, yes. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, Adizman, Omar Dizman says, I guess that is Adizman. After all this time, his name is not Adizman. It's Omar Dizman. <laughs> After all this time. Because his, his Insta yeah. is Adizman. Let's take, so Adizman says, can we say through the Prophet, oh Allah, grant me this. Yeah, yes, for my love of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa That's what I'm offering. My offering to Allah is the love of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa So grant me this. A member of the Sadafi community studied in Dar al-Mustafa in Yemen. This is yeah, T. Is Abish Ahmed. A member of the community of the Sadafi studied in Dar al-Mustafa in Yemen. Dar al Mustafa, they're a sha'ira and maturidiya. So, you gotta. Uh, if he studied there, it doesn't mean anything. Did he. Did he no, ab- what, he, what, he says, I this, what he says is basically they worship graves. They worship graves. Okay. He said first firsthand, his British accent, that they, they really worship graves. No, they, I'm sure yeah, that, no, they, 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 they do not worship graves. They don't worship graves. They're visiting graves. They worship graves, you'd be a kafir. Do not worship graves. Oh, oh, this was another one that he said. Okay, what did he say? Habib Omar had directed him to do a get a rukia done or something. Yeah. He said that the woman who did the rukia like like mumble jumbles random stuff, <clears throat> as if it was like some magic. He was alluding that it was straight magic. He's saying it's magic. Okay, yeah. I mean, so um, we have to go on that testimony. So. I don't, we don't, I don't know what to make of that. It's just a claim. It's hearsay to me. It's not like he's some upright witness. I don't know who he is. Right? So. From the Woods says, I'm not sure if you saw my previous MSG message. Do you have online Quran teachers available for other riwayas of Quran? No. Arkview does not have tajweed of other than Hafs and Asim. As Nuh Saunders adv- advances and learns those, then we will do it, inshallah ta'ala. Does touching a ma- ma- private parts break wudu? It, it breaks wudu for the man if he touches his private part with the inside or the side of his hand. Uh, Qasim from Instagram says, how would you pray Fajr when you are trying to make up a prayer? Would you pray two rak'a uh, fard qada? Give me that drink real quick. Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> okay. You would pray two rak'as of Fajr qada, and then you pray your salah, your hadr salah, or vice versa if you have time. If you're jammed on time, then you do your fard first, and then you do your qada. Your ada. Adat means prayer on time. Qadat means prayer that's missed. Make up prayer. So if you're jammed on time, you do your adat first and then your qadat. If you have a long expanse of time, you may do your qadat first, then your adat. Okay. Uh, so back to T. Abish Ahmed about, he said, a woman, 
uh, was there, and she did Ruqya, and then I found my phone, and she was talking another language. Well, what's wrong with talking another language, right? Firstly, I don't even know if to accept the testimony or not. But talking to another language, big deal. Oh, she was talking to a, a jinn. That's also permitted. Is she controlling a jinn and using it against you? Let's say someone's talking to a jinn. Okay, the jinn got his phone. They found his phone. So what's a big deal with that? All of the jinn doctors do that. When a jinn is bothering somebody, they deal with some other jinn and their Muslim jinn in their own way, and that Muslim jinn will remove the harmful jinn. Okay, what's sihr about that? And what's uh, um, shirk? There's nothing sihr or shirk. Then half the Pakistani are shirk. Uh, are, are magicians because that's all they do in Pakistan the righteous jinn doctors of Pakistan they're talking to Muslim jinn go and get and stop some other bad jinn from dealing with uh, harming another Muslim that's what it is do I know how to do that? no do I have interest in it? no do I want to keep talking about it all day? no but do I do know about it? yes I know about it from dealing interacting with you for 20 years the reason why I didn't get any doubt when I saw this video was because it's like, if you're going to like a top five-star restaurant, there's going to be at least one grumpy, like, terrible review course, yeah. about the shrimp or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no problem. But it doesn't mean it's bad. There's way better. There's many, many, vastly many more reviews. Yeah. Good reviews. So she asked him, what's the name of your mother and father? He flips out. Oh, please. Seriously. Your driver's license, they ask you for your mother and father. Whatever. But that is the way that uh, uh, these uh, doctors do it. And they're needed in their countries because the shayateen and jinn mess around and they're bothering people. It becomes a fard, kifaya, to deal with this. In the same way, we have to use kalam to deal with philosophers, right? If we were in India and Bilad al-Hind with all these mushrikeen using their jinn against us, it would be fard, kifaya, for some of us to learn how to fight back the jinn. And one of their techniques that they developed is to interact with Muslim jinn, not to control the jinn or use him against somebody, but use the Muslim jinn to help other Muslims who are fighting evil jinn. You see how simple that concept is? That's it. It's fad kifaya for them to do that. Am I interested in doing that? Do I do that? No. But that is a fact that they do. All right? They do that. Is that clear? Makes sense, right? And one of the techniques that the jinn needs, I think they need to know your mother and father's name. Allah alam why? I don't know why. But telling someone your mom and dad's name, where is that? You've gone way off to say that that's like shirk and sihr. Also, By the way, the dude got his phone back, so what are you whining about, <laughs> right? You should be going to thank Habib Omar for saving you $500 to get your phone. Instead, you use your phone to make a video against him. Also, yeah. the thing is, it's, uh, it seems like this guy, um, he was Salafi before. Yeah. And unless I'm mistaken. He was nothing before. He was nothing before. Okay. Before. Okay. But what does that really mean? You know, just because a guy says I was nothing before doesn't mean that he's already influenced. He's already clearly Muslim. And he already knows guys. Mm -hmm. So he's going in. And how long was he there for, Ryan? Do you know? So that's... You know, you're entering into a culture that you have no idea about. Yeah. And you don't, you know, you don't speak the language, obviously. You don't know what goes on. You don't know what their customs are. Yeah. So you can't pass judgments until you've been there for a while. Yeah, you have to get a, a, a large sample size and you have to understand. And in Bangladesh, they had a big problem a long time ago. And in East Africa, with wildcats, like tigers. And in East Africa, mountain lions. It became a fad kifaya for them to learn how to deal with these people. And in Bangladesh, they learned how to tame the Bengal tiger so much that they would even ride it. There's no sahra there. They learn how to do it. Why? Because it's a problem. Right? I think the camera's over here. All right, we're going to wrap up here as our camera's already wrapped up. Um, How do you met best make use of the theories of Ibn Arabi? We don't read his books, but we have a good opinion of him. Okay. Noah Yohannes, Jazakallah Khairan. HK says, um, 
Is there a way to private message? Yes, why don't you... S- oh, I guess there's, he's talking to somebody else. M says, there are some sheikh who completely forbid this sort of practice, especially if they ask their parents' name. They said that is shirk. No. Where's the jump, though? Where's the jump from that to shirk? No. If you use the shayateen al-jinn, or the Muslim jinn, which they call white magic, to harm another person, or to influence another person, then, yes, that is haram. That might, it, the white magic is using a Muslim jinn who is sinful. This is sinful. But he's using a sinful Muslim jinn to influence somebody in some way. That's a major sin. Black magic, now you're using shayateen al-jinn, uh, sh- the, the shayateen of the jinn, the disbelievers of jinn, and they will force you to do s- certain sacrilegious things and kufr and never make wudu, never say the word, word Allah, etc., etc., then we say that's shirk. But to speak to a Muslim jinn, to show them or to ask them to fight an evil jinn, that has nothing, there is nothing wrong with that. That there's nothing wrong with. Okay? All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, fortunately, we have to stop here. Chief Latif saying, is there a summer Arcview fit class? Yes, Maliki Fiqh. We are finishing up Ibn Ashir, and then we will have complete the full recordings of Ashmawiya, Akhdari, and Ibn Ashir. And by the way, we are completely revamping the entire arcview.org website. It's going to be completely revamped, so you're going to see it under construction. Uh, you'll see it. You can use it, but it's not going to be pretty for the next month or two until we really get it up and running. And it's going to be really good, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so folks, Jazakum Allah khairan. Um, please remember us all in your dua. You can help us on patreon.com backslash Safina Society. And until tomorrow, we'll see you uh, uh, tomorrow. Until then, have a blessed day. Oh, and Yes, we did uh, patreon.com and Mecca Books and Professors One to One are our sponsors. All right. So... Shout out to all of them. And you can get anything from Mecca Books by putting Safina as the, um, the discount code, coupon code, Safina. All right. So if you have any questions, hit us up at info at safinasadi.org. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu. وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Oh, baby.